The Labontes are considered one of the greatest families to ever race in NASCAR. While Terry and Bobby went on to be champions and eventually made the Hall of Fame, Justin Labonte's career faded into obscurity. How is it that this Labonte didn't make it to the Cup Series? Let's find out. This is NASCAR bust Justin Labonte. This video is brought to you by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. With over 100 offices nationwide and more than 800 lawyers and counting, Morgan & Morgan is big. They've recovered over $13 billion for their clients, and the best part? You pay nothing upfront for their services. The fee is free unless they win. They have attorneys who focus solely on every area of personal injury law, which include car accidents, slipping and falling cases, as well as workplace injuries. With over 3 million people trusting Morgan & Morgan, getting started is easy. At the conclusion of this video, head on over to ForThePeople.com forward slash Black Flags Matter in the description below, or you can give them a call at Pound Law or Pound. 529. Again, that's pound law or pound 529. Once again, a huge thanks to the fine folks over at Morgan & Morgan and you for supporting this channel. Growing up in a famous racing family, Justin Labonte was destined to be a race car driver. He began racing at the age of 15, winning back-to-back -back championships in Charlotte Motor Speedway's Summer Shootout Series. Next, he moved on to the Hooters Pro Cup Series in 1998, finishing third in the overall standings, scoring 13 top 10s along with winning the Consistency Award accomplishing all of this while racing for his father. By the start of 1999, Justin was only 18 years old, and a few more seasons in the Pro Series definitely would have helped. Instead, him and his father thought it was best to move up to the NASCAR Busch Series. It's only on a part-time basis, but with his father as a car owner and him entering the series with his famous last name, he was expected to show some promise right away. And by the year 2000, he had his his own video game. Instead, what took place during this part-time stint was one of the worst two-year periods in Bush Series history, performance-wise. You can see he cannot stop it as he goes down. Now watch this opening right here. As he gets that opening, the car turns into that outside wall. And hard. Marina tears the car up then. Here's a look from the speed shot at start finish. Wow. Watch the five of Dick Trickle and the 44 of Justin Labonte. Lifted him right off the ground when he tapped him in the rear there. Of course, uh, Justin was two laps down, getting ready to go three laps down, and Trickle got a tremendous bite coming up off the corner, it looked like, and I think he got up on Justin a little quicker than he than he meant to. That 44 car, by the way, is Justin Labonte. He's getting a lot of seat time. That is not Terry Labonte or Bobby Labonte in that car. That's Justin Labonte. Let's check with Ralph for more on the second. Oh, oh trouble in turn two. One car had gotten very loose at the top of the racetrack, and as it regained control, that squeezed everything together. But we have caution, because Barrett was putting down some fluid. There's Justin Labonte. He goes high in turn number one. So caution on the speedway at lap number six for a multitude of problems. There is Justin Labonte, who spun off and went high in turn number one. You know what? Oh, problems. Justin Labonte has shortened his Chevrolet, and we're under caution. 36th place is where Justin was running. He was three laps down. Justin, just ahead of Chad Let's Chaffin if, if they he... turn in. A oh, little contact that's there. That's it. Chad Chaffin might have helped nudge him along. Too bad for Justin. What happens there, Eli, is, is they see the car there, the guy checks up, the guy behind him doesn't check up, he has to slam on the brakes, and then they start losing control. So, you know, it, it's almost senseless in one uh, one respect, but when that first guy checks up, they run so closely together here. You see them come sliding in there now. They came from back there. There was nothing on the racetrack to cause that. We see him coming backing down off the wall and does get into Justin Labonte just a bit. 
in the 44 car. Justin already had a little damage on the back of his car. I didn't see where he got that, but he had already had damage in the back of the car. On just a part-time basis, in a total of 22 starts, Justin Labonte scored a total of zero top tens. And in a lot of these races, he was nowhere near close to running in them. The average finish over this two-year span was 30th. Up to this point, he's not even 20 years old, so there's still a lot of time to develop. It's still not the best look to run way outside the top 10 when you're coming into the series as a legacy driver. And in 2000 alone, he would have made 22 starts if not for those 9 DNQs. He made the wise decision to go late model racing over the next few seasons, but while he was doing that, some weirdo in Daytona Beach, Florida told a 17 year old that he was Terry's son in order to lure him. Very weird stuff, but in the time span from 2001 to 2003, he made one Bush Series start before returning in 2004 on a part-time basis, once again racing for his father's team, which is strange considering he raced for Hendrick Motorsports and his son is running a Dodge. Those expecting improvement got the opposite. By the time we reached summer, he had not even scored a top 10 yet. This makes his only NASCAR victory even more remarkable, entering Chicagoland weekend with 30 starts without a top 10. This one was expected to be no different, starting in 34th position, but towards the end of the race, he began reeling in the top 10, but with a ton of late cautions, as well as the leaders having problems throughout the day, gambling not to pit late would pay off. Mike Wallace was trying to save gas, and Justin put just enough pressure on him, leading to one of the greatest upsets in NASCAR history. And the white flag is up, and it's the final lap. Oh! Chicago to the outside. Oh! Mike Wallace, is he out of fuel? He's out of gasoline. You don't want to lead laps. this race. You just don't want to lead, is right. 70 laps was a bit too much to ask. Wallace is out of fuel. It's Justin Labonte and Jason Keller with a half a lap to go. Off of turn number four for his first NASCAR Bush Series win. Say hello to Justin Labonte as he wins the Twister 300 at Chicagoland. From no top tens to a victory? Are you kidding me? I remember watching this in first grade and thinking how insane this was. Nobody was expecting this, well everyone except Terry of course. Based on the performance leading up to this victory, I would personally put this in my top 5 NASCAR upsets. The win was short lived as he failed to finish inside the top 10 for the rest of the season, but it was good enough to extend his career for at least one more year. Because of his sponsorship with the Coast Guard, he was able to land a deal with Gene Haas. This was finally going to be a season where he would race full time, but quickly sputtered out of control after a decent start to the season. We saw the points a while ago, Justin Labonte, the 44, came into this race ninth in points. A bit of damage to both those race cars, uh, certainly the 44 of Labonte and Hornaday's car has got to have serious damage too. Well, that's a tough way to start, and there is uh, Justin Labonte rolling his car back into the garage. You can see the 33 is probably going off into turn three right now. And here this group comes. Look like they just started checking up. Justin Labonte got in the back of Tyler Walker. Now behind him, now everybody's hard on the brakes because he's coming across the racetrack. That's Mark Green in the seven getting by. He's alongside uh, Jerry Robertson here. I think that car just hadn't been that comfortable for Justin all day. He's been struggling a good bit. Around she goes. Boy, Brent Sherman just snuck through there on the outside. Oh, here we go. Around on the back now. 44 car. Justin Labonte spins. Caution. Caution's out. out. What a break oh. for Martin Truex Jr. Oh, it's though. not over back there, though. They're still wrecking. That's John Wood in the yeah, 47. Run into by John Wood. And Wow. And all these guys behind just had nowhere to go. Ashton Bush, the 25, he's not going to get through that, is he? And Bliss was in front of the wreck and still ended up yeah. in it. And you can't see anything at this point when you're behind that wreck with all the smoke. Yeah, yeah we're at the top of the screen, right in the center of the screen. Wow, how about Stacy Compton in that 59 car just barely squeezing through between the two spinning cars. Was that the 41 also that yeah. got through there? Yeah, it was Reed. Because he'd so been on pit road with his hood up. It's mm. burning off some fuel there. We're going to have to do yeah. something big time to this car because it is heavily damaged. How about a front clip? There we see the seven car. He gets tagged by the 32 car of Jason Leffler. He, he almost saves it. Yeah, no, he had it saved <laughs> if he wouldn't have got hit again. 
he would have saved it. And Justin Labonte had nowhere to go. Wrong place at the wrong time. Oh. And, and you know, and, and like I said, it doesn't take, that's all you have to touch a car yeah. on this racetrack to get them sideways oh. and wreck them. I mean, you almost have to, if you can look at the left rear quarter panel the wrong way, it'll spin out. I just, I think he just lost it trying to avoid the crash that was like. uh, happening in front of him. His only full-time season resulted in two top 10s with seven DNFs, an average finish of 23.1 with a 17th place points finish. After this, he would never run full-time in NASCAR again. He only made three Truck Series starts and one Bush Series start with Hendrick Motorsports in 2006 and 7. The only start for Hendrick Motorsports resulted in a 22nd place finish. If you can't run well in that equipment, at the end of the day, it just wasn't meant to be. Some are probably wondering why I have him labeled as a NASCAR bust when some just consider him a legacy driver similar to Kerry Earnhardt. The difference is Kerry didn't start racing until his later 20s. Meanwhile, Justin began at the age of 15. By 18, he had put together a solid resume and moved up the ranks. But looking back, it was definitely way too soon. Today, he is married, raising a family, and from what I can tell, he races locally whenever he can. Definitely a threat to win on your local tracks, but when it comes to his NASCAR career, unfortunately, three top 10s in 76 starts makes him a NASCAR bust. And once again, that'll do it for another video. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Black Flags Matter. Catch you next time.